Hello everyone, I'm Bart Massey. Welcome once again to Computer Sound and Music. As we get toward the end of this sequence of talks, today we're going to talk about one of my very favorite topics, harmony and chords. We've dealt with individual notes up till this point and dealt with them in quite a bit of detail, but now we get to think a little bit about how they fit together in groups. I hope you're doing well out there. Let's go ahead and get started. So, we have uh, harmonies. What, what's going on there? Well, it's as simple as polyphony to start with. More than one note is happening at once. And, you know, that's, that's a simple idea, but it turns out to be a really important idea. The Music would be pretty boring if it was all solo. I've heard beautiful solos in my life and hope to hear more. But two things, you know, even if you're playing a solo instrument, a band can be helpful. Also, as we'll talk about a little bit as we go forward, even if you are soloing, our brains and ears have been conditioned to hear the harmonies even when they're not there. Harmonies can be implied as well as explicit. And so understanding the harmonic structure of music is really important. If you're doing computing, you need to understand with music, you need to understand what kinds of things sound good, what kinds of things sound certain ways, and harmony in chords is a big part of that. So yeah. And, you know, we've talked a little bit and we'll talk more later about our scale setup one of the things that has been real important as we've worked through the music part of this course is this idea of equal temperament that in terms of log space in terms of note space the frequencies are spaced evenly apart we have these half steps and all the half steps are the same and today we'll start to get some more insight into why it's so important that we're able to change keys like that sort of this whole system was rigged so that polyphonies, a wide range of polyphonies would sound good, or at least equally not good. And that was a key change in Western music a few hundred years ago. And so to talk about that, we got to talk about intervals. I, uh, I'm going to have a keyboard off to the side here and be using it a little bit way to illustrate stuff. Remember, a major scale is just the white, you know, in C is just the white keys on the piano. So let's hear a C major scale. Let me put on my headphones here so that I can hear that C, C major scale. And I, you know, the instrument is nothing special. That's our fun MIDI synthesizer that we built in the class playing triangle waves and I'll use that here so as not to be distracting because it's fun to use our own stuff but you hear those eight notes and the first tritone chord everybody learns tritone three tones is the root note of that scale the C and then the E which is the third note so if I go there listen to those at the same time that's a really nice pleasant sound and then if I go up two more to the fifth and what I've got there is a sort of out of tune sounding and I'm not sure why but a tritone chord in the key of C it's a it's a it's the sort of fundamental chord in music and you know this sounds good because these things work these notes work well together the um third is roughly five fourths the frequency of the root it's if you work out the math and the fifth is roughly three halves so they beat together nicely ideally we could we could switch to a sine wave here and uh probably hear that even more clearly maybe that's a good place to go right now i think the the um, I think the triangle waves are more audible, but this may sound better. And those sound really consonant, right? If I hear, if I have, if I just play two half steps together, hear that flickering sort of tone? That's the um, notes beating against each other. They sometimes amplify and sometimes cancel. And with sort of 
randomly related notes like that, that beat sounds kind of terrible. With this, the third doesn't sound too bad. You can hear a little bit, but not much. That chord sounds pretty pure, pretty consonant. And there's a similar game you can play, which is if instead of going three whole steps up from the root, you go three half steps up from the root. So that's the same as flatting the major third. So if I go, hear that? That's a half step down from the third. And if I play those three tones together, the root tone, the minor third tone, and the fifth tone, I get what's called a minor chord. And you can see that the, here that those sound good together but they don't sound perfect. Um, and more importantly, that sounds kind of sad. And there's nothing inherently sad about that. It isn't like our brains or our ears are hardwired for it. It's just that we've gotten used to that idea in Western music. Uh, the frequencies are a little off, and we'll talk next time when we talk about, in about temperament and about sort of intonation schemes, that these things will... Uh, could be adjusted to be more smooth, but it's going to be at the expense of other things. Equal tuning's temperament is always a compromise. And the thirds are the worst here. The, the third is, you know, not great in equal temperament. And, you know, you, sort of one percent, one cent is sort of, it's below the threshold of human hearing, but it's not great. Your guitar tuner could certainly fix that. Guitar fretboard, let's look at a guitar fretboard. So yeah, here's a nice picture of a guitar fretboard. I'll blow it up so that we can concentrate on the fretboard itself. And you can sort of see what's going on here. If I stretch this all the way out, this is actually a long neck and it's hard to see. But um, the you'll notice that the frets aren't equally spaced. Now each one of those frets corresponds to a half step on that particular string. So if you start at this low E string, this is E, uh, D flat or E sharp, uh, no, sorry, E, F, what am I doing? Uh, F sharp or G flat, and then, oh man, I'm completely lost today. E is open, F is the first fret held down, so that's a little shorter. Uh, G flat or F sharp is the next one, and then G is this one. There we go, sorry, I don't know. It's hard to read a guitar when you're not actually fingering it. And uh, similarly with the other strings, the E string, the A string, the D string, the G string, the B string, and this other E string are all like that. And so you might wonder, well, why? Why are they different lengths apart? Well, they're different lengths apart because um, the tunings are not, you know, tunings are not evenly spaced in frequency space, right? And so the string lengths aren't going to be either. This is basically a log spacing between, uh, between frets, which is a really interesting idea. But if you really zoom out and look at the whole thing, you're going to see that the, uh, Sorry, I'll get it all on the screen. You're gonna see that the octave, which is right here, really is about halfway between the place where the strings hit on the bottom and the place where the strings hit on the top, the bridge and the nut. And so you're going to get uh, an octave when you play up that high. And because that's so far up and so hard to reach for, you don't normally play an octave that way. You normally move up to a higher string and that's kind of how a guitar works. So that. Uh, and you'll notice as well that if you find, look at the third, it's a sixth of the way down the string. The fifth is a third of the way down, which is exactly what you'd expect. The markers there on the guitar fretboard are at the minor third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, and the double marker is at the octave. So those, those little um, markers that you've seen on guitars forever. They actually have a useful meaning. This is the third and the fifth. Um, and yeah, so uh, they aren't just placed arbitrarily. It always seems weird because they skip two and then start down here. They go evenly for a while and then they skip two more. Well, that's because they're relative to the notes in a minor scale. So one of the things that's interesting 
is that because the strings aren't made of the same, you know, made of ideal material, they, they have weight, which affects how they vibrate, they're stiff, which affects how they vibrate, you actually have to adjust their little lengths a little bit to make these frequency spacings come out right. And if we zoom in on this bottom part down near the bridge, what you can see in this picture is some adjustments that can be used to actually adjust how long the string effectively is by sliding these little pins in it, turning these screws to slide these little pegs in and out. And that's so that you can get the intonation of the guitar right. And that's a really important thing when you're setting up a guitar is to get that right. And the other thing that matters is the pickup position. You'll notice there's, this is an electric guitar and there's two sets of pickups, one down near the bridge, the bridge pickup, and then there's one up here higher. Why would I have pickups in two different positions? Well, this one is getting more harmonics. It turns out that down here, things are mostly uh, the fundamentals of the thing. Well, is that right or is it the higher harmonics? Anyway, you get different harmonic content here and here because of the way strings vibrate. They don't vibrate there again uniformly. And so it, you get a different sound from the bridge pickup than you do. So, that's that. So we got these tritone chords, the one three five major chord and the one three flat five minor chord. And notice that I don't really have to use a C scale here. If I go C E G, then that's a perfectly valid tritone chord. If I go G B D, that's a perfectly valid major tritone chord and I can minor it by flatting the third and that's that works too and sort of one of the nice things about equal temperament is those are all equally in tune if I play a D flat minor chord that's D flat E um, A flat then um, then it's gonna also sound like a perfectly valid minor chord and a lot of times when we start to talk about music, we sort of chuck out harmonics, harmony in music. We, we, start to, we sort of chuck out the notion of a particular key that we're worrying about. We pick it. And we say, oh, yeah, we're playing in C. And then every chord we talk about is relative to C. We don't really worry anymore. If I wanted to transpose the music to make it sound higher, so if I play something like this... That's a perfectly valid blues song. If I want to play it in, um, oh, let's do that. Those chords, those notes, all have the same relationship to each other. And if I, if you didn't hear them right close together in time like that, and I came in and just started playing that, then you wouldn't you know, because the ear is mostly a relative pitch device, you'd just like, okay, the fundamental note in this is the F, or earlier, the fundamental note in this is the C. And your memory for that's long, but it's not super long. And so uh, that's a thing we can play games with. So we use these tritone chords everywhere, major and minor chords, and that's what it's all about. So there's this Roman numeral notation. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. I'm just gonna breeze over it. But the idea of Roman numeral notation is we pick a scale, we pick a key, and we say, well, we'll call that Roman one, the tritone major, and we'll use lowercase or minor for the you know, lowercase for the tritone minor there. So if, I, if we're in the key of C, the one is the C chord, the lowercase one is the C minor chord. And, you know, you can obviously do that for each note of the scale. Here's the two major, the two minor, the three major, the three minor, the four major, the four minor, and so forth. And, you know, so in C, that would be C, D, E, F in you know, G, it would be G, A, B, C, and so forth. And the chords you use when you're making at least normal, popular Western music are the nodes that are mostly the chords that use the notes naturally in that scale. And so in the key of C, that would be the, the C chord. 
which is C, E, G, no flats or sharps, the D minor chord, which is D, F, A, no flats or sharps, the E minor chord, which is E, G, B, no flats or sharps, the F chord, which is, you know, no flats or sharps, F, A, C, the G chord, the A minor chord, and uh, this one you don't hear much in popular music. This would be the seven minor chord, seven diminished chord, essentially. That's that's a weird chord because it's not really major or minor. It's its own thing. And you actually your ear actually fills in the G, and you hear it as something called a G seven chord. But if you play it if you play it really the way it's supposed to be, you might want to choose a, a diminished seventh, which would sound like. And that that helps you hear what that that's what that helps you hear what that chord's really you know fundamentally sounding like, and it's a weird sound. Uh, and in the minor scale, we can play the same game uh, if we're in the, the rel so-called relative minor to C is A minor, and that's the one that uses all the white keys as well. So we get the A minor, the B diminished again. The um, three chord here would be the C chord, and so forth. Um, and uh, and one of the interesting things in minor keys is if you have the minor chord, you might choose to use the sort of natural minor five chord, or you might choose to choose the, the major one because that sounds better sometimes. So happy major chords sound happy, minor chords sound sad, diminished chords are kind of spooky and mysterious sounding. Um, the augmented tritone that you'll hear occasionally is usually a tone that you use to travel, a chord that you travel from one to another. If I sharp the five, it goes kind of and you wouldn't usually end on that. You'd usually go to the four like that. So like that. And so, you know, those are the kinds of things you hear around in music a lot. And I should be really clear that it isn't like even all Western music, much less all uh, classical music uses just tritone chords like this. It's very, very common to add more notes to the chords. I already did that a little bit. You heard me play the diminished seventh, which is just to add the, to my diminished chord, go up another uh, three, like that. And that makes the chord sound interesting um, in a way that it wouldn't otherwise. The, the most common one in the in uh, popular music would be probably the five seven. So if I have, if I'm in the key of C and I go to the five chord, then I might add the seven, the natural seven, which is just two steps down from the root. And that that is a chord you'll hear a lot in popular music. And that's a thing. And yeah, you, you add a lot of stuff. A, a really common thing to do is to use octaves to get more stuff. If I play a C by itself, Versus, that's all the same note. It's the root note of the scale we're working with right now, but you can hear how much you know those effectively harmonics and subharmonics add in terms of the tone. And so you can build a big chord stack like that, where I play you know all together uh, as many as you know eight notes probably in in a key. Maybe I could finger more, but I'm not going to try. So that's just our C, our major chord, but it's our major chord played with uh, with eight keys going down at the same time. The other thing that's kind of a thing is inversion. We aren't going to worry much about it in this class, but obviously, you know, there's a lot of different ways I can find a C and E and a G on a keyboard to play a C major chord. So I can play it the way I was originally, or I could go move the C up an octave. That's uh, that's an inversion, or I could move the C down an octave, and that matters because the um, 
the melody is often thought of as being carried by the top note in the chord. And so what you'll typically do is, um, you know, pick whichever inversion of the chord um, is going to uh, have the melody. So. So you, you heard that all but one of those chords was a C chord, but um, but by changing which notes on top, I can effectively play a familiar melody. Uh, like I say, it's common to add the the natural seventh. So if I'm in five seven here, or I might choose to go with the. Uh, major seven the not flatted seven which which gives a very dissonant sound and is used in sort of uh bulky sounding or otherwise sort of mellow sounding music so if i take the four the fourth major seventh it's like there's c here's f major seven and you hear that strong dissonance in there but it doesn't sound bad your ear gets used to it and it's a thing you do if you if you listen to any america song you're basically going to hear um you know two chords and they're both major seventh chords and if you listen for that you're like okay now i know what america the band america sounds like um so yeah, there's lots of Roman numeral conventions. We're not gonna mess much with inversion notation and that kind of stuff. It's just too much. The the jazz thing, you know, tends to really warp this a lot, especially modern jazz. And so you'll often hear not only major sevenths, but major maybe major ninths or elevenths. And at that point, by the time you get to the eleventh. You know, unless you're really careful about, I'm not sure how many of those I can play at once. I guess most of them. That's a lot. That's a big chord stack, and it sounds a lot different than the the F chord that we started with. But that would be a very common kind of thing to hear in jazz. There's lots of things floating around that go by the name of minors, um, minor chords and minor scales. So that scale I described earlier in A, where you play up from A on the white keys to the, the, eight, to the next A, is the A minor scale. And that's sort of the relative minor key scale to C because it you know bears that relation that they all just use the white keys. So, and you know there's a lot of popular songs that play with the relative minor you know like that um the parallel minor is just the one you get by and that's that was the sort of natural a minor but that isn't the one that actually is most common in minor music, especially classical minor music. You typically play a game where you flat the um, seventh of that. That's the that's the harmonic minor, and it's a it's a whole different scale. And there's a billion you know different kinds of minor. You can go explore that on your own if you want to. Uh, but the the relative minor and the parallel minor in particular have a lot of relation to to the majors in Western music, and those will be mixed together. And really, that's you know where it all starts to come from. And pop, you know, when I talk about pop, I'm talking about so many different musical styles at once that it's not even reasonable, right? I'm talking about everything from you know that it was inspired by jazz and blues and rock and country and rock was sort of you know a, has a bunch of stuff mixed into it besides that and so you know when i speak about pop in general i can really only use the most gen generalities but really one of the things about pop is that it's sort of west the a very distilled simple kind of western music the typical thing is that you get one four and five chords a lot
so you know that's that you can play an awful lot of pop songs with nothing more than that and the other thing to do is to use the sort of one four and five in the relative minor so you'll use the six chord which is the relative minor and the and probably the two chord and then either this one the three chord three minor chord or the maybe the three major chord and so you know with those six or seven chords you can really cover a heck of a lot of the entire pop repertoire it's um this is very typically simple music um harmonically uh and we typically don't mess with roman notation which is kind of why i kind of breezed over it earlier typically when we're playing pop we will hear uh we'll get We'll, it'll be nailed down to a particular key. And so instead of seeing one, four, five, we'll see C, F, G. And the, then a melody in standard musical notation is often supplied. So you'll get this thing of a melody on the music staff like we looked at earlier. And then above that will be written the chord names of chords in the key that you're in. Um, and even when you have full music, it's really common in pop to have the melody, the lead line on a separate staff. And it's really common to label the lettered chords so that guitar players don't have to read classical music notation to be able to play along. So here's, a, here's an example of a lead sheet. This is Pete Townsend's Let My Love Open the Door, which I had no idea was a Pete Townsend song until I started teaching this class. Um, sorry, this is not... Yeah, here we go. So this is an example that has that style that I was talking about. Once you get past the intro, which is written out for whatever reason, it's, uh, you know, you've got the melody, you've got the, the piano part written out, but you also have the guitar chords up on the top so that people can play along. And you get, when, when people keep repeating that you'll never fall in love, Everybody keeps repeating, but you can't seem to get enough. And you'll notice that, you know, in this whole thing, it's just one, four, five, one, four, five. It's literally simpler than the famous four chords video, but, uh, but it is enough that an experienced musician, somebody better than me, you know, a group of them can walk in, pick this lead, this sheet up and, immediately start playing without any real hesitation. And the bass line is also commonly included, especially when the bass note of a chord is also commonly included, especially when it's different from the tonic of the chord. So if I'm playing a C chord, then normally the bass would be playing a C. But I might choose to score it with an E, or even with a G. Bass. And the bass, like the melody matters, like the top note matters, the bottom note matters, because that anchors down the chord. And a, a, G, a C with a G bass has a very different feel than a C with a C bass. And uh, it's pretty common to, uh, you know, have even some really weird stuff. So a lot of songs, for example, written in, in C would have the... To keep, would sort of keep the tonic as a drone even when it doesn't match with the note. So here's that's the that's the five chord with the one bass and that's that's really common in pop music and it does have its own distinctive sound and so you have to notate it like that. Um, You've all seen probably Four Chords by Axis of Awesome, which is fantastic. When I taught this class last time, we sat and watched it and talked about it a little bit. But I think because I want to keep this video under some reasonable time limit, I'm going to skip that. I, maybe we'll talk about it in class tomorrow. Uh, but that's not the only super common chord, chord progression. We've got, I'm gonna switch back to the sawtooth because I can't take this boring sign synthesizer anymore. I wanna play it in something interesting. Let's not do saw, let's do triangle at least. Uh, that's better. Um, 
So this is the sort of standard. Oops, sorry. And that's the one that, you know, is sort of the four chords by Axis of Awesome progression, the one that Axis of Awesome calls out. And it is very, very common, especially in more recent popular music. It's sort of become quite, uh, <laughs> quite common. Um, but, you know, it goes a long way back. You know, one of my favorites is Journeys Don't Stop Believing, right? Singer in a smoky room, smell of wine and cheap perfume. on and on and on and on right i mean there's no you know th there's a lot of that in songs going that far back all the way to the pleasant day another one that i already played with a little bit is these blues chords progressions that kind of do and then they switch so that's sort of the one bass progression and then they'll switch to a four bass thing And you'll notice I was grabbing the sevenths there. That's really common in blues, the natural sevenths. And then, then the turnaround is usually in you know a five four thing. Um, so you know that kind of progression is you'll hear a lot because it was so influential for so long. There's sort of the progression that dominated 1950s music to the point where I really don't ever want to. I'm not a big fan. One of the few genres I'm not a big fan of is 50s music, and it's because I'm partly because I'm really tired of songs that all sound exactly alike and they go, all go. Of course, that's also the very famous chord progression of heart and soul and a bunch of other things. So um, this is a very classic progression. There's the Packle Bell progression, which is in a billion popular songs. And, uh, you know, for example, One Tin Soldier, an old 60s ballad is like that. Um, it's But it's around in a billion other things, too, and you can look them up. And there's a link here to a Wikipedia page that has a million of these. Um, I think I'm just going to finish this out. So there's this notion of sort of the reason we're playing an impl temperament is so that we can use more than just the wet keys. We can shift... Um, keys during a piece and in pop a really common motif mo motif of that shift is to use what's called the circle of fourths so if i walk up four steps on the scale now 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 i can treat that as a new temporary root note and i can think about the four and five of that the four is now b flat because i started in c and went to f and the five is C again, but now it sounds different because it's relative to that F. <clears throat> and so having jumped up like that, I can then walk back down. The ear does remember what sort of key you started out in pretty well, even after you've changed it a lot of times, but it is really common to have whole passages that are in a completely different root note, a different key than the original. So, you know, if I go... Um, right um that whole that whole uh thing almost was played in the relative fourth but you know but then I walk back to the root, and you're like, oh, yeah, we were in C again. And that's that's really common. Like I say, with rock, it's really common to walk up the circle of fourths. So what do I mean by that? Well, if I walk up to the fourth of F, then I'm at B flat. If I walk up to the fourth of B flat, now I'm at E flat. And so if I'm pl playing along in C like this and jump to E flat... See, I can walk back down now 
And that's a very, very sort of modern classical rock kind of thing to do. Um, yeah. And it's not like, you know, having sat here and sort of a lot of you may be thinking I'm sitting here dissing pop music. No, I love pop music. And, you know, I keep talking about how simple it is. And one of the geniuses of pop music is that it can be this simple and still do everything it does. But it isn't like bands don't use all the chords <laughs> um, and some bands more than others. I'm a big super tramp fan and they'll do all kinds of stuff with diminished chords, diminished sevenths, really fancy key changes. Uh, one of my favorite key changes of all time is in a super tramp song. Um, it's so smooth that it's really, really hard to notice, even though it's a weird key change. Um, and uh, you know, so it isn't like, you know, I'm stereotyping here, but stereotypes in this case work for a reason. It's because a lot of pop is very, very simple. Now, you know, that was a nice talk about music. Yay, music. But I really want to talk about the computer part of it, too. Uh, you know, the things I wanted you to get out of this from the point of view of you may be dealing with music as a computer programmer, you should figure out what a lead, you now kind of know what a lead sheet is and that it's a viable thing to produce or to consume if you're doing music. Uh, it's actually hard to do analysis of chords from the audio and so knowing a little bit about what structure might be there is really super helpful if you're trying to sort code chords out of a piece of music. Again, the top note is usually the melody, the bottom, bottom note is usually the root note of the chord. And, you know, if you're gonna generate music, strongly suggest starting from the harmonic structure. The, the chord should come first, the bass should come second, the melody should come a distant third. And, you know, it's fine to have what's called accidentals, notes that aren't part of the tritone chord that you're working with, but, you know, in general, the melody should sort of match the chords. And that's what I meant really earlier when I said that even if I play, even if I'm solo singing, even if I have some very solo thing, um, you know, you're hearing because you remember it, but also because it's implied, you're hearing a lot of, uh, chord structure in your head there. And so it's really important that, you know, you don't just generate melodies without any idea of what chord structure is going on. And obviously this is just a starting point. This was a long lecture by the standards of our recorded lectures, and yet it's still, you know, barely, barely, barely scratches the surface. It turns out there's a billion fantastic videos on YouTube describing a lot of this stuff in much, much more detail. There's a whole rich literature on the web and out in the world of books that describes it all. So if you're a non-musician and feel a little overwhelmed, well, you should. And if you are a musician and still feel a little overwhelmed, well, you should. This is a very, very deep and complex topic. But hopefully I gave you enough of a brush over the surface of it that musician or non-musician alike, you can at least get a little handle on what's going on. And that's all I can do today. So. Thank you very much for listening. Like I say, stay safe out there, and I will talk to you again soon.